We're going to talk about tectonic plates, life on Earth, and the Fermi paradox now. Mm. The Fermi paradox being the expectation that intelligent life will have evolved many times across the galaxy, but that despite that, we failed to find any aliens. Well, at least we think so, right? <laughs> <laughs> Some might be in power oh, around the world. <laughs> no comment. As Enrico Fermi put it, I, I love this, where is everybody? Yeah, where are they? <laughs> um, that's the paradox. Um, or is it a true paradox? Um, we're going to attempt to resolve it here. <laughs> we're going to try and answer the question of whether we're alone in the galaxy. Um, but we're going to start with plate tectonics, which, of course, as you will all know, is the system of movement of these vast plates of rock that make up the shell of the planet. And they form mountains. Uh, they, they're cause, uh, the cause of earthquakes and all that stuff. So, you know, it's really embedded in our understanding of the planet, isn't it? That mm. It's hard to believe that it's, until quite recently it was really controversial um, and only became accepted in the 1960s. Yeah, I can't believe it was so recent. Yeah, Alex Wilkins is here to talk about this. Alex, um, there's still actually a lot of debate about it, isn't there? Yeah, so as you say, there's a consensus of how it works now. Um, but in terms of when that started, how many plates uh, used to exist on Earth and, and what that looked like, there really is a lot of disagreement still. So some researchers have found evidence that they could have been existing as long as 4 billion years ago. Um, that is quite tentative and lots of people disagree with that finding. But more widely, people have found evidence that kind of 3.2 billion years ago, um, 2.8 billion years ago, it seems to be pretty good evidence. But there's this wide margin of kind of when exactly they started that we just don't have mm. good evidence for. So last week I was at the Goldschmidt Geochemistry Conference in Prague and I saw a talk where the researchers talking were saying that they found evidence of unambiguous tectonic activity 3.5 billion years ago as well as a reversal of Earth's magnetic pole at the same time. Mm. Mm. So this is all quite soon after the planet itself formed 4.5 billion years ago and as someone who's very interested in the origins of life lots of bells are ringing here because that period between 3 billion and 4 billion years ago there were some really cool things happening on this planet in terms of life kicking up but before we get into that what's the new evidence then for this earlier date for when tectonics may have started yeah so this evidence is actually really different from all the other evidence we have normally geologists look at the chemical makeup of rocks called petrology um or, or looking at kind of the, the chemical makeup. But this is a field called paleomagnetism. Mm. So they find kind of these preserved magnetization signatures in the rock. And if you think about Earth's magnetic field as basically a giant bar magnet, mm. the anything that is magnetic will line up in the same direction as that bar magnet. So the geologists can go back, find the magnetization of these uh, signatures that are well preserved and find that if they track them over time, then they will kind of move along with Earth's magnetic field. So if the rock is moving, if you imagine like a, a tiny compass and you move it very slowly over time, then the needle will slowly move depending on where it is in relation to Earth's magnetic field. Wow. So when the pole flips then, what happens to the rock? So that's another kind of feature. The pole is only flipping kind of once every tens of millions of years. Yeah. So presumably they will find a, a swap in direction of the magnetization in the rock when the pole flips. So the rocks in this study then, uh, they're from Pilbara, are they? Uh, this is this amazing site in Western Australia. Yeah, so it's actually incredibly rare in terms of kind of geological sites. There aren't many other sites in the world. One other big one that we know of is in South Africa, which is really important for the study that I'll talk about in a bit. Mm. But this region is a kind of vast area in Western Australia, about a 12 hour drive from Perth. And the rocks there are really well preserved. So they're in neat layers. You can go down and you can track all the events that happened over this really definitive time region, um, unlike other areas where it's all kind of crumpled up and difficult to really unpick. So it's amazing that that area survived, isn't it? That's why it's so rare. It's just not been eroded. It's not been subducted. It's still there. Well, yeah, because of plate tectonics. Um, yeah. I, I did an interview years ago uh, with someone who was saying the number of uh, the amount of rocks we have that are around four billion years old. It's tiny because mm. the vast majority of them have been sucked Recycled. under, melted yeah. exactly because of plate tectonics. Yeah. And there's fossils there as well from that that age as well. Yes, from right, the earliest a, fossils. We've a lot got. of the most exciting, potentially earliest signs of microbial cells are coming from Pilbara, mm. I guess, because it's this really geologically stable region. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. So how are people interpreting this finding then? Um, presumably, you know, 
it's not like all geologists have jumped on board and, and we now think it's all tectonics started at that time. No, definitely not. Um, so there's a really wide range of what people thought tectonics looked out mm. looked like at that time. Yeah. So some people think it was basically an entirely closed lid with no movement at all. Huh. Some people think it was kind of lots and lots and lots of tiny little plates that were all moving about and, and some people kind of think it was somewhere in between. Um, the difficult thing about this study is that there's still quite large error bars on how much the plates moved. So on the lower end, you can get people who will fit their theory saying there was no movement at all. If it's the upper end and it really did move a lot, then you'll say have people saying there was loads of tectonic plate activity mm. at that time. It's a right old squabble, isn't it? <laughs> it's been going for ages. Um, but look, we said at the start we're going to get into the, how this relates to the origin of life and the Fermi paradox mm. because it's more than just this geologist squabble. <laughs> Any geologists here, I'm not dissing you, but, you know, it is a big deal in geology, but it's more than that, because without the tectonic plate system, we, we wouldn't be here. Exactly. That, that's the argument. So tectonic plates are responsible for the kind of constant churning of the earth. And when it thrusts rocks up into the atmosphere, that's really important for the carbon cycle. So uh, rain falling on rocks will either release CO2 or lock CO2 in the ground. And without that weathering, then there won't be a stable atmosphere for Earth. And if there's too much CO2, then you get runaway heating and life won't be able to survive. Mm. So in that way, it's really important. But also that constant churning of rocks will also release elements and, and kind of minerals that are crucial for life as well. Yeah. Um, so that, that argument exactly has been made by Robert Stern of the University of Texas at Dallas. And I spoke to him about about the importance of tectonics to the or the evolution of complex life. Um, and here he is. Plate tectonics is a very effective way of increasing the nutrient supply to the oceans where animal life spent most of its time evolving. You know, life didn't really crawl out of the oceans until about 300 million years ago and then evolved on land. But it, this nutrient supply it basically was allowed uh, the proliferation of increasingly experimental animals and um, complex. And um, plate tectonics also, it does a superb job in regulating the climate of a planet. And, and there's a number of reasons that that happens, but we've got a superb climate for advanced life. The third thing that plate tectonics does to, to encourage life is it provides habitats you know, especially shallow marine habitats, and then on land, different kinds of, of places, uh, continents where, where life will evolve, and then brings these habitats back together, and these evolved organisms compete and evolve further in, in the constantly changing surface environment. So essentially, there's this idea that um, to have a, a live planet, you need a geologically live planet, tectonics bring a lot of nutrients into the oceans, which gives complex life something to get going on. Tectonics also regulated the climate. It built lots of different habitats to evolve and thrive in. So so with that sort of idea in mind then, uh, is this how we're going to solve the Fermi paradox right here, right now on the show? <laughs> do, do we expect plate tectonics to be rare and therefore that's why we haven't heard from anybody Some people yet? do. Um, so the Fermi paradox, just to reiterate that, that's that we might expect there to be many rocky planets in habitable zones mm. around their stars um, but according to this resolution of it mm. um, if they don't have plate tectonics then they won't have been able to evolve complex life they might have got to simple life but they wouldn't have got much further than that yeah so the kind that could actually come by and visit or send you a message <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> the kind that could listen to us or send a message yeah, yeah. Um, i spoke to another scientist about this is taras geyer at eth zurich um, and he said that small planets also don't have the mass to generate convection internally um, to have tectonic activity. So Mars is too small, uh, doesn't have plate tectonics, or it certainly doesn't now. And also planetary accretion models suggest that half of the planets that form around stars would also be too small. Mm. Um, so that's one thing. And the second thing is about the composition of the planet. And here he is. Second important factor to consider is planetary composition, which in turn depend on the stellar composition. Some stars that essentially having too much of light elements and resulting planets, they, they have also too much of light elements. And as a result, you know, crust or oceanic lithosphere that forms is too buoyant and it cannot sink in the same manner as on Earth. 
you know, cannot drive then plate tectonics and subduction will not be efficient even in presence of water. So, and the calculation shows that uh, at least one third of planets would have sufficient, sufficiently heavy composition to support plate tectonics. So then we multiply two probabilities, one half to one third, and we are around 17% of planets that may potentially support plate tectonics. So by this reckoning, only 17% of planets have what we need for complex life to Yeah, evolve. so that's what him and Stern are saying. So they've added two additional terms to the Drake equation. And that, as you know, is the estimate of the number of extraterrestrial civilizations in the Milky Way mm. that might be detectable by us. Um, so the two terms are the fraction of habitable exoplanets with significant continents and oceans and the fraction of those that have plate tectonics. And if you add those two in, it brings the, the value produced by the Drake equation right down. In other words, there may be very few um, civilizations out there in the galaxy. So we're, we're pretty lonely then. It makes our own planet just all that more special. It, yeah, there's a nice spin on it. Okay. Yeah. yeah.